Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 96, Tim Eskew and the Embodiment of Leadership. Here's a shout out to listeners in South Africa and in the U.S. and Iowa, the cities of Ankeny, Des Moines, Muscatine, North Liberty, and in Oklahoma, Bethany. With that, let's get started. At an International Society for Performance Improvement, or ISPI, conference, I heard Tim speak, and besides being a dynamic speaker, he's an author, instructor, consultant, and the managing partner at the East Valley Leader Lab. Tim started his career with 15 years at Intel Corporation before founding a management consulting company that he ran for more than 20 years. One of the stories you're going to hear takes place when he was at Intel. And one more thing. If you need help with semantic practices, talk to Tim. Part 1. When your body reacts for you. To be effective at leadership, you need to continuously learn about leadership and how to practice it. Of course, there's many ways to learn leadership. You could read a book, attend a course, and hire a coach, just to name a few. To learn leadership, I recommend a simple process. It's called learn, do, assess. You learn about new content. You practice the content or try to apply it in your work or what you do. And then you assess how well you're doing. In this story, Tim describes an area of leadership development that's slowly becoming more and more popular. He explains how he got involved in this type of leadership development and shares something that someone said that made Tim realize he was thinking too much. For people who don't know me, I've been in the performance improvement field for over 30 years. You know, I've had a number of mentors and a number of, been taught a number of things that have affected my life. But the thing that happened most recently, so this is about five, six years ago, and it really had a big impact on me personally and my career, was when I attended a leadership and coaching program put on by Bob Dunham at the Institute for Generative Leadership. The context is in my 30-year career, I've focused mostly on what I think of as commitment-based approaches to management and leadership. You know, the planning and the monitoring of progress is done with a focus on commitments versus activities and tasks. We do that largely with a focus on two things. One is sort of a structure, a process that's different than most organizations are used to using. And then the language that we use to focus on commitments. About six years ago, somebody heard me presenting and said, oh, it's interesting. I hear you talking about language in this way. And do you know Bob Dunham? Because he speaks about language that way as well. And you you might be interested in talking to him. So I got interested in that and I signed up for a four-day course. I did learn some interesting things about the language, but something else happened in that training that I wasn't planning for. It revealed a big personal blind spot of mine. What it was specifically that Bob said that impacted me so deeply was that commitment actually resides in our bodies. I've been focusing on commitment. I've been helping teams use commitment and build commitment for all these years, but it never occurred to me that commitment resides in our bodies. So it really caused me to kind of step back and say, hmm, interesting. What does that even mean? Luckily, the way Bob structured this course was it was around the possibility that a lot of participants would not be familiar with that, would not be really in touch with their bodies and the role that our bodies play in how we show up in life and how we show up as leaders. We did a number of somatic exercises, kind of mind-body exercises that caused us to, and, and always asking us to notice what was going on in our bodies. The way that showed up for me was I had great difficulty sensing these things in my body. I came to realize this was a bit of an issue for me. I was kind of cut off from my body. I now have a pretty good understanding of how that happens and why it was going on in me. But at the time, it just was really puzzling to me. Now we're five years later, and I stayed in Bob's program for a couple more years. Just by coincidence, I happened to start going to some Tai Chi, Qigong somatic sessions completely separate from this training at about the same time. Five years later, I found I was able to use Tai Chi to break through and get in touch with my body, how it affects how I show up and how some of my old habits were based on things going on in my body that I was not aware of. It's had a big impact. 
In addition to putting me very focused on Tai Chi and bodily movement, I've actually shifted my career. I've moved from focusing on the management of teams to introducing young leaders to embodied leadership, what that means and helping them get in touch with, you know, create more self-awareness about the role their bodies play and what they can do about that to grow as leaders. When you speak of Tai Chi and Qigong, those are Chinese arts. Tai Chi is slow movement exercises and Qigong is similar, but you're not moving around as much. Yeah, I mean, I think they're closely related. I, I was thought that Qigong is sort of one manifestation of Tai Chi, one form of Tai Chi. I agree with you. The movements are going to be more subtle because the focus is more on your energy. When you talk about embodied leadership, most people probably would not know what that means. Maybe you can give a snapshot of a little bit of what that is in contrast with just helping people manage and lead teams. Sure. The short answer is, if you think about leadership training, what can we do to help leaders be better leaders? We can show them role models. We can look at case studies. We can talk to leadership concepts so we can talk about leadership. We can give people feedback. There's a lot of 360 degree feedback systems that focus on showing leaders kind of where they are on some sort of a continuum. All of those things are useful. What is often missing in the training is a recognition of how important our bodies are in the leadership process and how we show up as a leader. Embodied leadership is about using somatic mind-body exercises to help people see how do they show up in certain conversations and what is their capacity to have certain conversations. Some conversations are more difficult than others. And then build that capacity in their body. A very simple example would be a lot of people struggle in certain situations to say no. They really don't want to do something. They don't plan on doing it, but they find themselves saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'll try. Let me see if I can get to that. Something other than no. That has to do not just with the words you speak. It has to do with your body and probably with your history, something deep in your history that makes it difficult to let people down for example. So how do you overcome that? You don't overcome that by talking about the fact that it's difficult to say no. That just doesn't change anything. You have to try new actions. In embodied leadership, what we do is get people in touch with what's going on in their bodies in these situations. We do exercises to build the capacity to say no. We will put people in positions that are very representative of the word no and practice saying no to each other in these positions until you get to a point where when you're in that situation where you, you'd really like to say no, this body capacity comes up for you and you are more comfortable saying no. Just a small example. When you're raising awareness of your body in situations, for example, when saying no, is it recognizing you're tensing up, your body language, folding your arms, looking concerned, things like that? All those are examples of self-awareness, and it all begins with self-awareness. Part of that self-awareness is the felt sense. So being able to feel, you know, what are you feeling in your body? What are you feeling in your organs? What are you feeling in your muscles under certain situations? When we do somatic exercises, they're designed to put a little pressure on people, not physical pressure. We, sometimes we start with physical pressure, but psychological pressure. What is going on in your body in those different situations? Can you give an example of uh, one of the exercises that you might do with participants? Yeah. So one of them is the building the capacity to say no. Another area that is really useful in creating self-awareness is understanding what triggers you. What causes you to react? What kinds of things when people say to you or when a certain person says it to you or when a certain person speaks to you in a certain way, what are those things that trigger you? We do an exercise where people are paired up and one person will face away from the other person and the other person will come up and grab them by the wrist. When that happens, physically, tense up. The practice that we're trying to do is to relax, take a breath, and then face what's just grabbed you, what's come at you and you're ready to have a conversation. They may be coming to you angry. They may be coming to you ticked off about something that's going on that somebody else did. One of the things of being a leader is not falling into that trap, being able to settle things down because you're calm and you know, let's have a rational conversation. The triggers, like you're saying, when certain things happen, we tend to react in a particular way. 
It's consistent. It's almost comfortable to react in that way. We may never realize that we're doing it, but we develop mental or neural pathways that strengthens that type of reaction. And it sounds like what you're doing when you're working with participants is, as you said before, you're raising awareness and then you're offering an alternative way to react or to behave when that particular trigger happens. Exactly. So there's a couple words that I'm almost hesitant to use because they get thrown around a lot, words like presence and centering. These are capacities that we are building. But when people think of being present, they think of sitting on a park bench and staring out into nature. This is about how do we use presence to be in action? How do we use being centered to be in action? So it's always about what are we going to do in this situation? But the first thing you need to do is have your body not react for you. Once your body reacts for you, then that, in a sense, triggers another behavior and another one that guides you down a path that may not be helpful or even healthy. Exactly. These neuronal connections and pathways. So these triggers are from way back in our history. They're during our formative years, during our child and adolescence. They have to do with our basic needs around safety and connection and belongingness. We all develop coping mechanisms as we're going through those stages. And then the question becomes, 30 years later, you're leading a team of 100 people. Are those coping mechanisms still serving what you need to do with this group to move into the future? Part two, an example of courage. If you're a manager working in a difficult culture, it can be not only challenging but stressful to try to do the right thing. The norms of the culture push you in a particular direction and you need a lot of courage to go against that. Tim shares a story from his days at Intel that exemplifies this struggle and this courage. Here's Tim to explain. As a management and leadership consultant, I've observed people leading in a lot of situations When you raise this question about what's the story you you most remember about someone else leading, it takes me back probably to the story that I have the most in-depth knowledge about. And it ended up being the kind of the introduction to the first book that I wrote called No Surprises Project Management. So this is back at my days at Intel Corporation. And it was during the time when Intel was going great guns. They had tremendous demand. Honestly, they couldn't keep up either in designing or manufacturing with the demand. Some of the design teams that were designing what were going to be the latest, greatest products to supersede the ones that were very successful right now, they were really struggling. In one case in particular that I became very familiar with, the leadership of the organization kind of ran out of ideas for helping these teams go faster. So they just put pressure on them. When they started a project, they would set what everybody looked at and said, that's an unreasonable deadline. But they thought the less time we give them, the faster they'll go. But they were having some serious execution problems. So a number of people were called in to have a look at it and see if they had anything to add. Uh, I was lucky enough to get asked to go take a look. We looked at their past performance. You know, we looked at the actual data, not just the stories. We observed them for several weeks and we came back to them with a story of our own about what we think is going on. And this is where I first started to see the importance of personal commitment. And basically the picture we painted for them was There was a series of, it was sort of a vicious cycle they had created, which started with these unreasonable deadlines. It led to team members not telling management what was really going on. It led to people not speaking up when they were concerned about the quality of the work that they were doing or their peers were doing, and ultimately caused a lot of rework and then delays on these design projects. We got this opportunity to share with the team that was going to take on the next most important product design what we were seeing and asked them if they wanted to try something different and that we would help them best as we could. A fellow named Mike was the project manager that was up. Understand he was steeped in this culture of do everything you can to make them go as fast as they can. But he also saw when we created this systems diagram for him, this was not producing what they wanted to produce and that something had to change. The reason that this story, I think, is such a a great example of leadership is because Mike was not supported by the upper leadership of the organization. Well, he took our advice and started differently with this team and said, okay, here's, you know, when they're telling us this needs to be done. I want you to tell me when we can get it done. 
He made some promises to the team that he was going to hold them accountable for what they told him they could do, not for what had been opposed on them. Imagine the pressure <laughs> that created for him from the top down. Every week, he would have to go into a meeting and say, no, the team is not committed to the date you gave us. We're committed to this date, and here's why. He did that week after week, and this team got through the first couple phases, and there was some obvious change going on. People were very focused on quality, and it was causing them to move faster. They actually exceeded their own goal by a couple of weeks at this second big milestone. This is where it really became interesting because Mike, under all this pressure from above, went into the next planning meeting with the team and said, this is fantastic, you guys. You're exceeding what you told me you could do. Do you think maybe we're going to make it? Do you think maybe we could, we could meet top-down management's goal? And they had an absolute connection. This was such a, a lesson in trust because Mike had really been taking some grief to cover for this group. The minute he suggested, maybe we can make it, what they heard him say was, I was holding you accountable to that date all along. Ah. To Mike's credit, when the team had this very verbal connection, he took a breath and said, okay, I promised you I was going to listen to you and that's what we're going to do. The team, they weren't just randomly saying, we can't do this date, we can only do this date. They said, every time we get to this point, you guys start pushing us. There are quality issues that we don't resolve because you're pushing us. And then we get into the test phase and we find those issues and we have to go through the whole process again. That was exactly what we saw happening in the data. They were going through multiple design cycles, revision cycles on every design. And that's what was pushing out their dates. I was not aware. I had this blind spot around the role of the body. So I wasn't paying attention to, was Mike demonstrating good leadership embodiment? But I do remember this meeting and them giving him this pushback. I can't imagine very many people that wouldn't have reacted in that situation. And I was so impressed that he stayed calm and went back to his original commitment and said, all right, I'm still with you guys. That demonstrated to management that there is a better way of managing these projects than the ingrained culture of just pressure. I would so love to tell you <laughs> that the leadership of that organization, you know, held Mike up as a role model and said, this is the way we're going to do it from now on. They were just too ingrained. My colleagues and I were hanging around the organization to see what was going on. We heard senior members in other parts of the organization saying things like those guys on the XYZ project. Did you see that? They went home at 6.30 last night. They're phoning it in. The organization was so used to interpreting good work is long, long days that they interpret it as this team's not really committed. First of all, you know, it takes a while after these projects go through the design phase, then they have to get into manufacturing before you find out how well they sell. This product broke so many records, but they didn't know it until a year after the design team was done. All they knew was they were getting good reviews. People were look, getting early samples and saying, this looks different from what we've seen before, that we love the quality. They didn't know for sure how it was that it was going to break all these revenue records. Uh, Mike's reward was to be a little bit demoted. They paired him up for his next project with one of the kick butt and take name leaders and said, Mike, you need to kind of relearn how we do things around here, which was heart rendering for, for those sure. who had this context of, wow, you know, they're really unhappy with the outcome they're getting. Let's try something new. We tried something new. We got a fantastic outcome and they didn't learn from it. But that's ancient history. You know, that's happened a long time ago. Oh, yeah. It just goes to show, though, that the importance of time. So the positive results, like you said, took a year or more. The tendency is, especially with management people observing, is what are the immediate results? And if they don't like the immediate results, they assume it's bad, even though you needed more time to really see the return on the new behaviors. Yeah, it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction, you know, and in their defense, they were under tremendous pressure. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue on these products. And if they're delayed by a couple of months, you're losing tens of millions of dollars in real cash flow. So the pressure was extreme. If we're going to take a systems look at what's going on, you can't take that knee-jerk approach. Part three, embodiment, realizations, and how to show up. When you embrace leadership and commit yourself to developing your leadership, you commit to some substantial behavior changes. While the new behaviors build your character, the process is not always comfortable. 
Tim advises us on how we can develop our leadership, and he talks about some of his challenges with his own development. Again, here's Tim. I have to focus on the thing that made such a big impact in my life five, six years ago, which is this embodiment piece. It didn't just change the way I thought about my work with teams. It really changed the way I live my life because I became aware of how I was showing up and some of the things that I was doing that were counterproductive based on old programs from my formative years, old fears. Let me just give an example of that. This was a leadership and coaching course that I took that I spent a few years in. I don't consider myself an experienced coach. I've done behavioral coaching, but this was leadership coaching. Effective leadership coaching is much more about listening and asking good questions. You're not giving advice. You know, you're not critiquing the person's behavior. This was part of the course, and I hadn't done much of this before. It scared me because in all my years of working with organizations and making presentations, my modus operandi was to work and work and work, prep, 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 memorize, because I was so afraid if I left something to chance, somebody might find something that I didn't know and embarrass me. I hate to put it that way. It came down to some strange, irrational fear. And so I made a lot of presentations and I created a tremendous amount of work for myself. And I didn't enjoy it because as I was doing all that prep, I was getting myself all worked up about what if I forget something. This idea of sitting down with an executive and hoping that I can come up with a good question frightened me. So I came up with ways to prepare to do leadership coaching and quickly found out that those didn't work because my prepared questions became irrelevant pretty early in the conversation because you can't anticipate where it's going to go. But I stuck with it and I did more of these sessions. I eventually came to a point where I realized that if I just listened, the questions would come. I had to trust that I'm not going to be caught out flat-footed. I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'll either have a good question or I'll say I don't have any more questions. The difference that you just described is sort of like the reverse of a traditional conversation. What I mean by that is when you're talking or when someone else is talking and you're listening, a lot of times we focus on the next thing that we're going to say. What am I going to say next versus focusing on what the person is saying and then using inquiry to better understand what they're trying to communicate And it sounds like when you went into these coachings, at first you wanted to prepare what you're going to say, anticipating what they are going to say in advance. But what you found out is you have to listen to situate how you can help them by better understanding what they're saying and what their situation is. That part was told to me. We learned about coaching and I learned why it's important to ask questions rather than giving advice. Then I had to learn to trust myself. Ah. And I couldn't do that by talking about trusting myself. I had to build some different capacities in my body, right? That had to do with using my breathing in these meetings to bring my focus to absolutely listening to what's going on, not thinking about what I'm going to say next. It took a lot of practice and it was built on top of a number of self-awareness and other somatic type exercises. Our mind is constantly racing. We don't realize what's going on. It seems so important what you're saying is by being in the moment, focusing even on your breathing and realizing what's going on around you, you can do a better job at listening. Exactly. So that was an example of how I've come up with new actions, new strategies for being in certain conversations. It was a bit of a journey for me because I had to start from, wait a minute, I can't feel anything going on in my body to, oh, okay, now I feel it. Yeah, I don't like that feeling. I'd like to make that go away. How do I do that? So I have to put myself in uncomfortable situations and manage feelings, not by holding them down, but by experiencing them and realizing they're harmless. They're just giving me information. All of this was such a revelation to me personally. And I, you know, I got so much value out of it. I mean, it not only makes me feel more comfortable every day in my conversations, it's caused me to, again, shift my focus. I want to share this with other people. As we said earlier, there are many aspects of leadership development, and I'm not saying forget all those things, just do embodiment. I'm saying if you don't have an embodiment piece, if nobody is doing somatic exercises with you, then you're missing out on an important part of your development and your growth as a human being and as a leader. And I recommend people check it out. There's a fellow named Richard Drozzi Heckler who has been practicing this, sharing it with others for 40 years. I didn't hear about him until five years ago. 
There's Bob Dunham, who's been doing it for 30 years. And I'm seeing more and more examples come across of people offering these types of things. That would absolutely be my first piece of advice is see if you can integrate some of this. If you're committed to growth as a person and as a leader, find some place that you can try out embodied learning, embodied leadership, somatic practices. We recommend you do this live with people. And that's why East Valley Leader Lab is mostly a local effort. We figured out how to do our introduction to embodiment virtually because of COVID, of course. We could be a place to give you a, uh, an introduction if you're, if you're looking for a place and can't find one locally. My thanks to Tim SQ. If you'd like to learn more about Tim, go to the show notes. And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and you can leave a voicemail message for up to one minute. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your donations makes a difference because this is an all-volunteer service. Lastly, I'd like to thank you for listening. This is Gary DePaul. Lead on!